at a time of an ever-widening wealth gap, the need to broaden access to land is urgent. Land access lies at the heart of issues of equity, affordable housing, vibrant main streets, sustainable agriculture, ecological restoration, renewable energy, alleviating, alleviating the effects of climate change, and social entrepreneurship. It's that important. Community land trusts provide a regional way to fairly redistribute working lands. My name's Susan Witt. I'm executive director of the Schumacher Center for New Economics. I have a shaky hand and a shaky voice. Please excuse it. It's not because I'm afraid of you, it's a familiar tremor. In 1980, I helped found the Community Land Trust in the Southern Berkshires. Then in 2015, its sister organization, the Berkshire Community Land Trust. A Community Land Trust acquires land by gift or purchase creates a land use plan to determine how that land should be best used, taking into account ecological considerations and the needs of the community. It then leases the land to individuals or organizations on a 98-year lease. The lessees own the buildings and other improvements, fences, wells, roads, perennial stock, but not the land. The land remains in a regional commons in perpetuity. The lessee can sell the improvements on moving, but at no more than replacement cost of those improvements adjusted for deterioration. So a fair return on their investment, but the land value remains held by the community. It's not again capitalized. The community land trust in the Southern Berkshires has three parcels with a total of 24 leaseholds. Indian Line Farm in Egremont, thriving in CSA. Forced Row, a neighborhood of 18 families. And Alvastra on Jug End, with three homes and two nonprofit buildings. None of these were built with state or federal monies. All of the cost of building these out these three parcels came from donations from people within the community and the cost um, from the sale of the buildings. That's it. No state, federal monies, local initiative. But what we have seen over the years is the growing need to increase access to land. As land prices rise, there are not enough government funds, not enough foundation dollars to meet this need. It will take a broad movement of land gifting into community land trusts if we are to even in a small way address the growing need for diverse access to land. 
Berkshire Community Land Trust is a tax-exempt organization that can accept gifts of land suitable for housing, farming, manufacturing, retail. It would then turn that land over to its sister holding corporation, the Community Land Trust in the Southern Berkshires, to lease and manage the leases. We would like to see gifts of working lands to community land trusts be as common as gifts of ecologically sensitive lands to conservation land trusts. That's our goal, to increase the amount of land held in the common. If you have such a gift of land to discuss, please seek out one of our board members. John Bullop is our president. John, would you raise your hand? Today's program is sponsored by Berkshires, Berkshire Agricultural Ventures, Berkshire Food Co-op, Berkshire Grown, Berkshire Waldorf High School, Egremont Land Trust, Good Work Institute, Great Barrington Agricultural Commission, Green Agers, thank you. Um, John Philip Associates, Architects and Planners, the Nonprofit Center of the Berkshires, the Nutrition Center, Southern Berkshire Community Development Corporation, and the Watershed Center in Millerton. These are some of our favorite nonprofits. Please join them. And it's going to take all of these groups working together uh, to bring attention to the issue of land access. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce my Schumacher Center colleague, David Bollier, who will introduce our speakers um, this late afternoon on the topic of the impact of private philanthropy on local economies. David Bollier is one of the best known authors on and advocates for the commons. His 2014 book, Think Like a Commoner, is kind of the go-to text on the commons. He is co-author of the forthcoming book, Free, Fair, and Alive, The Insurgent Power of the Common. David was the 2017 speaker for this very annual meeting. It's a pleasure to welcome him back. Join me, please. I'm David Bollier with the Schumacher Center for New Economics. I direct the Reinventing the Commons program, and I'm thrilled to be here with you all. We have two really remarkable philanthropists to join us. Uh, Peter Buffett with the Novo Foundation, and Peter Taylor with the Taconic uh, Community Foundation. And I'm going to give a brief introduction for both of them, and then we will uh, begin to explore the topic of philanthropy and local community transformation and the different ways in which this can occur. Let me start with uh, introducing Peter Buffett. He's the co-president of the Novo Foundation with Jennifer Buffett. And uh, he found an unusual path to get to philanthropy, starting as a, a commercial composer for film and other media, uh, picking up an Emmy along the way and writing a book, uh, Life is What You Make It, which made it to the New York Times bestseller list. He now uh, pioneers a kind of uh, venturesome philanthropy both in New York and Kingston, New York, where he resides. Uh, and he also, drawing upon his previous background in music, does a, a series of concert and conversation performances around the country, most recently under the auspices of the United Way. Um, Novo is now funding 
a lot of fresh bottom-up initiatives that show great promise. And he has a penchant for trying to convene diverse shareholders, or stakeholders, I should say, around a common problem or goal. Uh, they're very active in Kingston, which I suspect will be a lot of the focus of his conversation today, uh, especially through his Supporting Thriving Local Communities program at the Novo Foundation. Peter Taylor is the president of the Berkshire Taconic Community Foundation, which was established in 1987. It, uh, it comprises, its area of giving includes Berkshire County, uh, Litchfield County in Connecticut, and in New York, Dutchess County and Columbia County. A uh, very different type of, of, of philanthropy and foundation than Novo, which we will get into. But uh, Peter is, deals with a lot of special challenges uh, of philanthropy in rural regions with a uh, focus on economic, economic opportunity, educational attainment, and community engagement, among other topics that we'll get into. He formally uh, had a role at the Maine Community Foundation, where he dealt with many similar issues, including post-secondary education, fostering leadership, and uh, helping Maine's environment and downtowns flourish. Uh, he's been deeply involved with philanthropy for many years, including with leadership roles at the Council on Foundations, grant makers for effective organizations, Maine Philanthropy Center, among others. So why don't we start off by uh, asking, I'm gonna ask each to give a brief overview of their work, their foundation, their special character of their foundation, and the types of grant making they do, especially within uh, local communities. And Peter, why don't we start with you and the Novo Foundation. Turn on my microphone, okay. Hello, thank you, thanks for coming. Thank you, David. Um, so I'm glad you brought up the, the earlier part of my um, somewhat adult life. Um, for many decades, I wrote music for commercials and television and film, and uh, what that gave me is a comfortable sense of the unknown, uh, creativity. Someone would walk in and say, we need something by this afternoon, and I, I started to get comfortable with that. And of course, didn't recognize that years later, uh, that would inform how Novo works uh, more thoroughly than I would have ever even expected, and mostly because I didn't expect Novo. Um, my wife Jennifer and I had a small foundation uh, that my parents uh, gifted us uh, in the late 90s, early 2000s. But in 2006, uh, what I call the Big Bang happened. My dad decided to give all his money away, and that was wonderful, but we did not realize we would be the recipients of some of that. Uh, Jennifer and I ended up in 2006 with a billion dollar foundation, and um, Billion Dollar Foundation, it, 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 you're better looking, you're funnier, you get invited places, you know, it's this magical thing that happens. Um, but quite seriously, it, it, we did not inherit any legacy, uh, any expectation, uh, it was a blank slate. And that was an extraordinary gift, again, that I didn't fully realize at the time. But, but given uh, the creative nature of both Jennifer and myself, uh, the fact that we suddenly had resources that could be uh, distributed in ways where, you know, my dad wasn't directive at all. Um, there's feedback slowly coming in somewhere. Um, uh, you know, that gave us just exciting possibilities on what we could do. And, and so I will say that um, in the short version of what we do, you can go to the website to learn a lot more. Uh, but it's around uh, starting with girls and women and supporting girls and women in a variety of ways, uh, supporting social emotional learning, uh, how kids are, are raised and brought into the world uh, through the current school system and hopefully beyond, uh, work in local communities, which is of course what we'll talk about today, uh, and indigenous communities as well. And, uh, so there's, we're doing a lot of work in very specific areas that I feel are all related. Uh, and uh, that is the short history of the Novo Foundation. <laughs> Peter, tell us about the, uh, the, uh, the Ber 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 I'm sorry, the uh, Berkshire Taconic Community Foundation. Yes, first of all, thank you to the Community Land Trust and Schumacher Center for pulling us all together here today. Um, Berkshire Deconic is a, is a community foundation which is a place-based funder and so we predominantly care about people and places and how those elements come together to, strong, to build strong and vibrant communities. 
Um, we've been around, as David said, for 30 years, and we serve a, a funky region across four counties uh, in three states. Um, unlike a, a private foundation, which Peter described, uh, a community foundation is really built around relationships, and we, over our 30 years, have established about 540 funds uh, through uh, the philanthropy of individuals and families and organizations and community groups who care about this place, care about the people in the place, and want to use philanthropy as a tool uh, to bring about positive social change. And so over the course of those 540 funds in a given year, you know, we make around $7 million in grants, and we also manage uh, endowments for nonprofits, and we distribute about $2 million a year to support nonprofit missions uh, through that stewardship of their endowments. Um, so it's a little bit different from a community, uh, from a private foundation where Peter and Jennifer and a board really uh, come up with a strategy uh, for how they want to pursue their philanthropy against the goals they establish. We support the goals of many individuals and families. Uh, but the, really the art of community foundation work, in my view, is how a community foundation and its deep knowledge of place, its deep knowledge of the issues that are really uh, critical to this place, how we can pull together uh, those, those resources, those relationships, and focus them on some of the most pressing issues facing our region. And as David said, uh, at, the, at Berkshire DeConnick, we have identified three issues where we are in the process of building donor relationships and nonprofit relationships to try to uh, have philanthropy contribute to solutions on those issues. Um, so there is a little bit different in terms of the locus of control, in terms of decision making, but uh, a network that is under a community foundation that is really quite powerful. Thank you. Uh, thank you for those introductions. Let's start talking with about how you intervene, how you decide what might be an effective way to have a positive impact on the community, either in the midterm or the longer term. And I'd be curious about some of the strategies strategic priorities that you both uh, encounter in trying to move forward. Peter, Taylor? Yeah, I'll, I'll start Call on that. Peter and you might yeah, get either one of us. I will use your last name since right. the... Uh, you know, for, for the foundation, how do we start? Uh, you know, we start again. I mean, we support individual donors and community groups that are addressing their issues. And we, uh, we support them by... by uh, giving them uh, information and introducing them to organizations that are working in the areas. We bring groups together, we convene. Um, we also, though, in the last three years, have been really placing a, 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 an emphasis on data and different types of data to really better understand this place and the people in it. Uh, we undertook a fairly in-depth community assessment process that put a premium on outreach, and so we did not just rely on the quantitative data, even though that's important. Uh, we really wanted to go out and listen and learn from the residents, uh, from, from individuals uh, who were living in communities that were experiencing challenges, as well as opportunities. One of the things that's important about the foundation is that we very much take an assets-based approach, but we're clear-eyed on the challenges. And so you asked, how do we intervene? We intervene by listening and by learning and through connections. And substantively, what have you learned from that data? What are, what are the opportunities people want, or what do you think are some of the needs that need to be addressed? Yeah, there are three things that surfaced, I think, that are most germane to this conversation. David, um, one is through that assessment process, uh, we learned that there were concerns around the levels of community engagement in our region. Uh, this is a region that uh, has a deep tradition of connectedness and people coming together to organize around issues. A proxy for that is just the, the depth of nonprofit organizations that exist. And so we heard from uh, our outreach that there were concerns that perhaps the level of engagement is not as high today as it was 10 or 20 years ago. That's really hard to quantify, but as the region's community foundation, we wanted to do that. And at the time, at the same time, when there are demographic changes, uh, where there's a, a large influx of immigrants, which are so important to the vitality of this region in the long term, uh, to our communities and to our workforce. How can we really invest and work uh, around building cohesion and trust in the region? So community engagement is one. Uh, the other two will not be a surprise. Um, income uh, inequality, uh, poverty is not going in the right direction in this region. Especially, uh, 
especially, uh, you know, I'll mention here in Berkshire <laughs> County in the last, you know, 20 years, it's gone up 25%, which is, you know, it's still mm -hmm. below the national average, but again, it's, 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 it's going in the wrong direction. So income inequality is an area that we are focused really, again, through an assets-based perspective in terms of how can we create economic opportunity for residents here. Uh, and then the last one is um, really um, about um, uh, jobs in the economy, which is very closely connected to income uh, inequality. But uh, as we did our work in the region, listening and learning, jobs was the predominant issue that came up. Uh, there's been a shift in you know, shift in the economy, but uh, now a mismatch between the, the skills that many employers need and what residents can offer. So jobs in the economy is the third. So I'll we'll get to Peter Buffett in a moment, but I just, I'm curious, how are you trying to create more jobs or deal with inequality in programmatic ways? Well, there are, uh, in, in both those uh, areas, we are working in partnership. Uh, really trying to, to think in new and creative ways about the role of philanthropy in uh, supporting economic opportunity and economic mm -hmm. development. And so we know we have something to contribute, but we know it will be much more powerful if we work with others, others in the private sector, other in, others in government, and other funders. And so we have been working, and I'll spotlight the work in Berkshire County since we're here, really across that coalition to really investigate, you know, what are the conditions around economic development, especially uh, uh, business support and supporting individuals and existing businesses that want to uh, contribute to the economy through enterprise development. Mm -hmm. So we have undertaken a lot of discussion and listening and also analysis on how we can think about philanthropic capital broadly defined, yes, mm -hmm. to include grants, but thinking about loans and investments, but also what's that, you know, what are the core conditions around economic development? How does someone who has an idea, who wants to start a business, especially if they do not come from a family or a background where uh, they have watched their parents do that or their grandparents do that. How do we support those residents mm -hmm. who want to start an enterprise that can allow them mm -hmm. to more meaningfully contribute to the economy? Mm -hmm. So uh, I can share more about how we're doing that technically, but I, I want to Well, let's, sure. let's get into that in a minute because there are a number of specific areas we can talk about. Peter Buffett, tell yep. me about, <laughs> about the Kingston experience and some of your, uh, the history and points of engagement in developing things there. Yeah, and I, thank you. I, it's because of the, the history of the foundation and the fact that it doesn't have one, you know, it does give us this sort of blank slate, which is uh, exciting. And, and we did for a number of years work uh, through the the lens of girls and women and gender and justice and uh, though that and we still do um, but as my wife Jennifer and I moved up north of the city uh, there was a lot of time for uh, frankly just connecting to nature and reflection and a lot of learning and reading and and, and you know listening is the if real estate is location 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 philanthropies listen 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 yeah, for sure and and this awareness now that lived experience is such a critical piece of it. That wasn't always the case. People had sort of this colonial mindset of coming in to solve the problem uh, that other people were having. So it's nice to see those things changing across the board. Um, but my work in Kingston, our work in Kingston, it was informed uh, more than anything else from one event. And uh, that was after uh, Hurricane Irene in 2011. Uh, and uh, the, first of all, I'll say that I have a few phrases for the foundation that aren't publicly announced anywhere. And one of them is that Novo Foundation is putting money out of its misery. And we can talk more about that later. Uh, uh, but the other one is that we're uh, trying to practice 21st century alchemy. We're trying to turn money into love. And what does that look like? And how do you create that experience and those conditions in place specifically? So after Hurricane Irene, I was driving around with my wife, Jennifer, looking at, you know, it was extraordinary. I'd never seen anything like it. Uh, we were out of power for a week, and, you know, it was, it was a big one. And uh, what I was so struck by was that these uh, tall, mature, seemingly intractable trees were, that were solidly in the ground a few days before 
because what a hurricane does is, you know, it, it covers the whole watershed. There's no place for water to go. The ground is totally soaked to the point where these trees uh, th that, again, are healthy, solid, big trees, they lift up out of the ground and just fall over. The root ball, I'm sure you've all seen it, the root ball and all, it's just fallen over. And I looked at that um, because I do believe nature holds most of the information we need to, to learn from. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. If, if the ground gets soaked, these seemingly intractable things, just they just fall right over. And so as simple as that may sound, I thought, well, if, you know, here we have uh, a couple of interesting ingredients. The foundation bought a 1,500-acre farm, a very wonderful, fertile farm, right near a 23,000 uh, population community, Kingston. And those were interesting. Uh, combinations of, uh, you know, it's one thing to have resources, it's another thing to have land uh, that can support the people that it's close to and, and vice versa. And we had uh, aligned city government, we had aligned, still do, um, county government, and, there, it, it, and a lot of young activists in the area. And, and so I started to see these ingredients as the ground, literally and figuratively, and thought if we can uh, soak this, not indiscriminately, but if we can go in there and be in relationship, which is critical, uh, and, and learn and listen and, and start to see where we can soak the ground and see what can fall over, uh, see what things that seem like they're just the way things are and they always will be, of course they aren't. You know, we're, we're making it all up. Uh, the favorite reference to that is what day is it? And we all say it's Sunday because we agree it's Sunday, right? We have all these agreements about what's happening right now. And most of them were put in place a relatively short time ago. Uh, it's been 150 years for most things, uh, including wage labor. I mean, it was considered un-American to, to have uh, be a wage laborer, or certainly the last thing on the list uh, for, uh, you know, until the Industrial Revolution. So. Uh, my the kind of fascination with how we got here and then seeing that we had the ingredients to maybe help get out and how interesting that money might be the solution to getting out of the thing that money created to some extent. Um, so I'm not sure if I've answered your question well, that's, yet. That's a, that's a but, fascinating, it's a fascinating but that's overview, a little, but what's, right. I'd like for you yeah. to give some more specifics of some of the instruments. Right. You mentioned exactly. the farm, the which farm. is critical. Right. Yeah. And in fact, I'd like both of you to address the important, this is, after all, the, uh, the Community Land Trust right. meeting. Right. And yeah. I'd like to know the importance of land right. as a, a keystone issue on lots of issues yep. that we confront. And, and so the first two uh, the interventions, to some extent, or, or you know, uh, creations of conditions, the farm absolutely first, and that is an ongoing process of orienting a farm from what was a monocrop sweet, sweet corn three generation business operation into something that is related to the community in ways that we haven't completely figured out, but we know we're orienting that way. And that's a lot of this is how we're orienting things. And, and it, you could see it in the culture of the farm. Everybody is on the same page, but we're writing the book <laughs> as we're doing it. The second uh, big intervention, uh, or, or uh, again, it's, I don't like to call it an intervention, but whatever you named it was right, um, uh, was a radio station. There was a legacy radio station in Kingston, uh, I think 79 years old, 80 this year, I think, um, AM station. Uh, it was the voice of the community. Of course, it ended up getting sold and sold again and sold again to the, a corporate owner that, hold, that you know, had 400 other stations uh, to where it was essentially ignored. One guy kept the lights on, uh, and he's still there, he's wonderful. Uh, and I was able, the foundation was able to purchase that for a, a surprisingly small amount of money uh, given the asset that it, it promised to be. Uh, and it's been going now for about a year and a half, not quite, uh, and it is transformational in terms of the community uh, hearing itself, understanding it, itself, uh, really having a dialogue in, because it went from <laughs> a corporate-owned AM, oldies from, you know, broadcast from somewhere else except for a few hours a day, uh, to a community-run station that it's, first and foremost, it was about reflecting the voice. We have 30-some programs now that reflect just about everybody there. 
Uh, I just came from their spring uh, party and it's extraordinary to see what happens when a, a community is given the ability to, to talk to each other and about itself and understand each other. So that has been a surprisingly robust and, and fast transformational element that I really didn't see coming. I, I knew there was something important about the community in relation, but yeah. The, the farm and the radio station, the, I could name a whole bunch of other ones, but those are big infrastructure pieces. Well, it, it seems that really a recurrent theme maybe for both of you is the importance of infrastructure, of which land is an important part. And maybe Peter Taylor, you could talk a little bit about s some of the roles of land or other infrastructure in helping to uh, uh, improve communities. Certainly. Um, you know, what I, I like about Peter's example of the radio station is that it's a it had been and it had the potential to continue to be a key strength and hub for, for civic life in Kingston. And so you saw, you know, it's, it's past, but you also saw that it had a future to, to play that role and you, and you had the nimbleness to, to, to secure right. it right. and to make sure it remained community owned. Right. Uh, to, right. to, and that is so important in terms of civic infrastructure. You know, you mentioned land and land broadly defined. I mean, land obviously is very important here in Berkshire County because of, of, of you know, the, the rich natural resources here and the heritage of, of outdoor activities and the scenic view sheds. It's just a spectacular place. Land is important. Um, you know, I just mentioned farmland being particularly important to this whole region as, as Novo has made a big investment on a farm. Farmland, broadly defined, is important. In Berkshire County, actually, farmland uh, is in decline. Uh, over a 15-year period, we lost around 11% of our working farmland, which is uh, problematic, obviously, as you think about local economies and its reliance on local agriculture, the jobs, and the economic activity that, that, uh, that produce and value-added products Produce, provide, um, but also once you lose farmland and you develop it for other purposes, it's lost forever, or typically if you, if you put a sub, uh, subdivision on it or, or change its use. And so I think protecting farmland is, has and will continue to be important uh, in places like Berkshire County where there's a rich heritage of agriculture, but also a sector that has so much promise for continued growth. I think another aspect of land that's important um, in terms of infrastructure is housing, affordable housing. And that is an issue here in, in Berkshire County in a couple of ways. One is uh, obviously the cost of housing is high. That's for a variety of reasons. Um, uh, the number of homes that are owned for second home purposes, vacation homes, that's such an important part of our economy, are, are those residents that come here for part of the year. Uh, you know, they often are, are members of boards of directors, they contribute locally, but those houses are not occupied 12 months out of the year and typically they're not sending kids to schools. So I think afford, uh, year round affordable housing is important um, in the context of land and even broader in terms of infrastructure, I think it is downtown centers that work and places like the St. James Place that allow activities like this where people can come together and, and, and uh, uh, and be together in community. Uh, and I think, you know, around town centers and, and facilities like this, I think a key asset in Berkshire County, which is a form of infrastructure, is the rich uh, uh, arts and culture that exists in, in Berkshire County. And I think that is a core asset uh, for community building and also key to the economic fabric of the, of the are, are either of you involved in uh, your philanthropy with community land trusts or some of the innovations that are going on there? I know the Schumacher Center, for example, has been exploring uh, community-supported industry and the gifting of land to try to accelerate the use of CLTs. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just curious what may be going on in, in your wheelhouse in both of those areas. I know you. You want to go first? No, you go <laughs> Well, uh, if there is a community land trust in, uh, in Kingston, and it was started by the mayor, actually, and a couple other people, so that helps, again, this alignment. And they were mostly oriented, in fact, entirely, I think, on green space and, and various ways they could uh, reclaim or develop uh, more green space in the county and the city. And 
uh, that was wonderful, but when I uh, started to get more involved, um, what I had learned from the mayor is that uh, in Kingston, I'm sure it's different everywhere, but after three years of uh, back taxes, the city forecloses on the home and takes it back and auctions it off. And the mayor was uh, very thoughtful in keeping all the single family homes out of the auction. He didn't want them going to speculators because gentrification is a huge issue in Kingston. And so he kept those back in hopes that there would be a mechanism to somehow get them back into the community, uh, knowing that the land trust existed, but actually wasn't thinking of that, I don't think, as the mechanism because he had started that for green space. Uh, but I came in and started to uh, look at the work of John Davis and others that have kind of spearheaded a lot of the land trust and land bank relationships. And I had learned that Kingston was on the verge of land bank status but hadn't gotten it from the state. We pushed that over the line and got it. So now we are in the process of all those 30 houses of which is now something like 36 or 38. Uh, being moved into the land bank that, that is a city uh, organization and they will rehab those houses and then turn them over to the land trust who has um, uh, you know, shifted their mission, which is something I didn't want anybody to, to do any shifting of mission if it wasn't uh, you know, embedded in, in where they were hoping to go. But they saw this as a real opportunity and realized that this is so necessary, again, with gentrification and affordable housing being in terrible shape in Kingston. Uh, it really does seem like it's the issue everywhere. Right? It's amazing mm -hmm. uh, how consistent that is. But uh, so, yes, so we are literally in this very beginning stage of the land bank land trust relationship. Uh, specifically for housing and to shift housing back into community and you know how that's structured is mm -hmm. we can go into that but I think it's pretty common. Peter Taylor? Well I, I have to say since we're, we're, we're at the annual meeting of the Berkshire Community <laughs> Land Trust I have to say I, I admire both you know the outcome that they're working towards and the process in which they, they, they go about it in terms of, of, of securing and preserving affordable housing uh, but doing it through community and building a community around that is so important. Um, and I think if you look you know, beyond that in terms of how the, the Land Trust and the Schumacher th Center are trying to think about um, cooperative industries and thinking about the economy in inclusive ways uh, to spot opportunities for, uh, for businesses either to, that exist or that can be created to stop the leakage out of of, of revenue that mm -hmm. is going from companies uh, either outside that are importing in, can we can we create that here and have that uh, that economic uh, transaction activity stay right here local? So it's again, it's about community, it's about place, but it's also about economic activity, and I buy all those factors together. Now, both of you have sort of led up to an issue that I think we should explore a little bit more, which is. How do you bring a diverse community together to help deal with some of these issues? Uh, you obviously, as a, as a philanthropy, can deal with a lot of issues yourself, but of course, much of the point is building the trust, the relationships, the shared purpose. So I'd love to hear from both of you about some of the ways that you've been trying to do that, uh, because that's uh, not, even, not just here, but I think across the country, uh, a common challenge that mm -hmm. we all face. Well, uh, I don't know who said it first, but the moving at the speed of trust line is a great one. And it's as fast as anyone can move if you really want to make things happen. And, and I, I go back to the radio station. I mean, obviously convenings and listenings and getting people in the room that wouldn't be in the room is critical. And the station, to, again, to some extent to my surprise, has played that role much more broadly than I would have expected because it's also going to City Hall and live streaming what's going on there it's going it's creating block parties uh it's creating convenings around particular issues so the radio station is sort of cover in a way or a front for all these mechanisms to get people to be more aware of what's going on in their community and then finding ways to engage around it so that's been our single uh you know biggest champion really and, and vehicle for getting uh engagement and and the community is hungry for it i mean we've been very fortunate i think that's a function of our time because of the the you know dysfunction of disconnection that's been happening uh people want it and and the station can really help provide it peter taylor 
Sure. Let me, first of all, since we're in Great Barrington, can anybody out there involved in the local radio station that's just come back into uh, active service here in Great Barrington? It's a wonderful story about how there had been a, uh, a radio station that had been programmed by, um, by individuals here in the community, and then it went through a period of just doing recorded music, and they've just right. set up a storefront again right here in downtown Great Barrington. So it's wonderful to go. see That's that great. The, yeah. the community come together to make that happen again. Um, uh, you know, how are we bringing people together, or more importantly, how, as importantly, how are we supporting others to do that too? I guess I give you two examples, David. One is, uh, I, I think you shared, and, and perhaps I have as well, an area of focus for the foundation is community engagement trying to foster more civic engagement and relationships and trust. And one of the ways that we're doing that uh, uh, in Berkshire County is through um, supporting arts and culture uh, as a vehicle uh, for community building, but also as uh, a way to empower others to see the creative process as a way to uh, express themselves and also to come together in groups to learn about one another. Um, we have a, we're in the midst of a, of a multi-year in initiative which is um, uh, supporting that in a number of ways. We're doing that in partnership with the Barr Foundation, which is one of, of New England's larger private foundations, and they are working with Berkshire DeConnick to support our efforts in Berkshire County. And so we're doing that uh, through a number of ways. Um, uh, you know, first, just in terms of listening to residents, uh, you know, as we started to approach uh, our aim of increasing community engagement through the arts and culture, we arts and the creative process. We knew we, uh, we 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 had researched it enough to come up with an hypothesis, but we also knew we needed a, to to know a lot more. And so, um, as the theme of this panel, we knew we had to listen to the community. And so we we went out first and we did a neat project called. Uh, uh, community-based participatory research where we hired uh, local residents in Pittsfield to work with a community researcher from Boston University to identify their questions in terms of the barriers in front of their neighbors uh, for uh, either accessing venues right now that uh, offer arts and culture or barriers to the creative process. And so that is one way that we're doing it in economic... In arts and culture, tell me some of the projects you... The specific, is this theater, is this murals, or...? All of the above. Uh -huh. uh, you know, we are, you know, one of the things that we have done, we've used the findings of those, uh, of that community-based research um, and we, we learned a couple things. One, um, uh, yes, cost and transportation uh, are a huge barrier for participation in arts and culture, uh, but, but as important to that is a sense of social inclusion, that when residents, especially those that are lower income or coming from communities of color, more, more uh, under-resourced communities, the, how much they see themselves and what's on the stage, mm -hmm. uh, how comfortable they are when they enter through the doors of a, a venue. Uh, do they see themselves in the volunteers? Do they see themselves on the boards of directors of those organizations? And so mm -hmm. that sense of social comfort is really important. Mm -hmm. So we're doing a couple things. One, we are uh, being a grant maker and we um, are, are putting resources out in the community to try new approaches. Uh, to uh, community engagement through the arts, but we're also supporting organizations that have this as a priority to help them in uh, strengthen their effectiveness in the work. So it's capacity building mm -hmm. uh, is another piece. And then we are also supporting coalition building. We're helping arts organizations come together uh, to, to leverage resources in their uh, and their experience, especially in the area of arts education, because of uh, the opportunity to partner with schools to have uh, uh, students uh, in K through 12 settings really be enriched by the arts and the creative process, both in terms of how they get to know one another, but also as part of their learning and development. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm curious how uh, things have changed over the past 20, 30 years in terms of philanthropy. Uh, you, uh, there's probably, well, let's, we can talk about climate change and we can talk about the global economy. How does this ref get reflected in how you do uh, regional or local philanthropy, Peter Buffett, or, well, both of you, actually? Well, I certainly wasn't doing it. If you're talking about changes in philanthropy itself. That's what I mean. This is new, yes. it's new territory for me. Um, uh, so I, but, but what I'm sort of fascinated by is how uh, over these past however many years it's been now, um, 
that people have seen our behavior and been inspired by it or surprised by it or something. Because um, again, we didn't have anything to work with, but in, uh, in terms of having to live up to something or into something. Um, but the I mean, exactly what Peter was saying around um, the approach, I think, is finally getting to the place of who's in the room? Do they look like the people we're um, uh, attempting to serve? Um, uh, the awareness of the systemic nature of things, the connections between uh, intergenerational poverty and the education system and trauma informed this and you know the, these kinds of so how has that changed how you make grants or make priorities well it I guess it really does get back to ultimately listening but making sure a lot of people are in the room that may not have ever been invited into the room that don't feel comfortable in the room mm -hmm. I think Russell Brand said it, there's a reason the halls of Congress look like the halls of Harvard you know, I mean, you just, you know, we forget how conditioned we are uh, to be inside uh, this frame. And so to break open the frame, you have to invite people in that have been historically left out. And um, so we do that in all of our work. Uh, you know, I, we work in social emotional learning and for a long time, these people are trying to figure out what do the kids need? What do the kids need? And it's like, why don't we ask the kids? You know, I mean, this kind of thing, <laughs> but this is new kind of breakthrough approaches, which is, you know, great, at least it's happening. Um, <laughs> but yeah. Peter Taylor. Yeah, I'll just build off that, the, you know, what's changed in philanthropy. And, you know, I think that that emphasis, that priority of, of listening to those that you're trying to support and to, uh, and to improve their well-being and their quality of life, uh, uh, checking your assumptions continuously, um, but most importantly, I think the best ideas for change come from those that are living in communities that know them best. You know, an example of how we have done that uh, uh, in an area related to land and economy is we have a multi-year initiative in Columbia County around increasing fresh and healthy food for low-income kids and seniors. Uh, we are uh, working in partnership with a very generous uh, anonymous donor couple um, and we did a lot of outreach when we were trying to you know develop our goals and our strategies but uh, one of our core partners is Hawthorne Valley uh, which is just a neat organization in Columbia County uh, that uh, has a working farm uh, and a school and does a whole lot more around community and economic development and Hawthorne Valley is a core partner of ours and and when we uh, we're working with Hawthorne Valley, but most importantly, providing them the resources to work in community in Columbia County. They knew they needed to go directly to the residents, and they started in Hudson, and they developed what's called a core group that met for about a year to really try to understand, uh, you know, the barriers to fresh and healthy food, uh, and also how uh, people uh, in Hudson, in particular. Uh, what their interest and their demand was for it. And even residents that were on public assistance, they had market power. They had resources to buy food and they uh, shared with the core group through surveys and outreach that you know, they wanted fresh and healthy food that was connected to their cultural traditions. Uh, and so one of the things that Hawthorne Valley uh, did in partnership with the community was support um, at first a uh, pop-up fish market in, on Warren Street because fish was very important to the cultural traditions to many people living in Hudson. And so they brought fish to uh, residents. I'm not sure if you all have been to Hudson, but Hudson is just a, uh, an eclectic community where you have Warren Street, which is, you know, has such a vibe and cosmopolitan feel and just two blocks away. Uh, you know, is a much different reality for residents in Hudson. And so how they, and, and it's actually quite far to get to the local grocery store in Hudson. It's about a 45 minute walk if you don't have a car. Uh, so they brought fresh fish uh, to uh, Warren Street uh, once every, think, two weeks, uh, three weeks, and they built a sense that you could buy local and fresh food right downtown. And so then they moved from that and they created a mobile market in partnership with the community. And now they have a retail store in addition to the mobile market. And it all started because they listened to the residents. Not only listened, but they brought them together in a coalition to, to, to term, for that coalition to determine the solutions. I'm struck I'll by throw your in patience, too. They patience. were also patient, right? I mean, it took a year, it sounds like. It did. Just, yeah. It did. Yeah. And I'm struck by your story and actually by that comment of the very 
paradoxical role of improvisation and patience mm -hmm. in, the, in the, that these things unfold, you often don't know where it's going to go. And yep. that must pose a special challenge to foundations in trying to uh, deal with the dynamic situation in which there's many more players than before. Yes, patience and, and, and flexibility and pivot is, is all that. And I will, I'll just share in this particular, in the example that I shared around the fresh and healthy food in Columbia County, we are indeed working with a very patient donor couple that uh, sees us very much as an expression of love and social justice. And so they are patient uh, and they have been flexible uh, in terms of, of, of seeing the progress that was being made in terms of building relationships and trust and being flexible in terms of the time or horizon to get the solutions that start to get some traction against the, the issue, um, mm -hmm. uh, but also flexible in terms of where the resources go. And, it, and it, to build coalitions, you need people to do that work. It does not happen on its own. You need people to, uh, to convene and to make sure that interactions are framed and facilitated and that agendas move forward. And so you need to be able to, to fund people that have that experience and expertise uh, to be able to, to support communities that want to move forward. Patience and love, yeah, they go hand in hand, I guess. <laughs> well, let me ask maybe what's an unfair question, but there's a history of economic development in communities, and then there's other phil philanthropy that could arguably serve social purposes that are not as directly market development. And then of course, in the meantime, there's been the development of a whole field called impact investing, in which it's providing capital that seeks some sort of return. How does, do those, some of those currents play out in your foundations? And uh, you know, it's probably complicated, maybe it's not either or, but I'd be curious to know how you approach those. Uh, I, 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 I think, you know, <laughs> let me, let me um, just maybe frame it this way and, and, and Peter has a lot more current experience with impact investing. I have some from my work in Maine, um, but we do have somebody who has, has, has a lot of experience right here. Um, you know, I think for, for me, um, uh, it's really starting to, it's starting with what your aim is. What are you trying to accomplish? Um, and what are the right tools to get there? Um, and I think what is important with philanthropy is that it is flexible and patient and it aligns the right tool for the task to get to the outcome that you want. Um, and so sometimes, yes, that is a grant. Uh, sometimes it's building a coalition, it's the people process. Um, sometimes it is a loan or an investment uh, because you need that type of capital to interface in a, in a market economy or to, to do something at a scale that's difficult for a grant to do on its own. Um, uh, and so it's really starting with what your goal is and what's the best strategy and what resource is necessary to, 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 to make that strategy work. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and oftentimes it's not one thing, it's a combination of things working together. I think the radio station example is a really good one where you, know, you purchased essentially an enterprise. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you've mm -hmm. not, I assume mm -hmm. it's either a nonprofit or it's a, right. it, yeah. it's a now it's a nonprofit, it yep. was a for-profit and a nonprofit now. And so yep. Yeah. You purchased, the, you know, uh, you know, an uh, uh, infrastructure Go, yeah, to do that. Right. Um, yeah. uh, so I think it's really lining up the the, the right tool for the task. Um, and I can, uh, you know, just briefly. I mean, actually, I'll defer to Peter, and then maybe I'll come back with some examples from my experience. But sure, Peter. Well, I mean, uh, like, it for us, it's. I think always a social investment first. It's never looked at through an economic lens. Um, and, you know, the, the word impact and impact investing is tricky because it, it, investing, of course, um, doesn't even imply it, it requires, I think, a return, even if you say it's going to be zero return. I mean, you're, you know, with the word investing, return is somehow attached to it. And, and I, you know, really, we're looking for a return of, um, you know, a different sort of social engagement and interaction and um, you know it's it's all the the soft stuff I guess as opposed to a hard quantifiable we want this back for doing this and uh, so it's 
framing it that way, you know, we will uh, we support a loan fund uh, um, in, run by indigenous people uh, in the south. Um, we we have supported some uh, some of those types of things that would con be considered, you know, market driven on some level. You know, it's specifically loan funds and, and but how they operate, the intention behind them is so not return oriented but social oriented still even when it's money going out it's small loans and it's in community and it's decided by the community and it's all these various factors that go into that so uh you know yeah i mean i, I don't if we really try and stay away as best we can from any framing that was built out of a structure that just isn't working for too many people. And so we try and look under the covers of that and say, okay, how can we shift this? And, and most often it's putting money in places without an expectation of return. And even, and I think maybe we'll talk about this a little more, pinning sustainability on it from day one, uh, because that can be shackles for somebody that needs just, again, to, to soak what's there you know, we do a lot of, of uh, multi-year general operating, that kind of thing, because we're saying we trust you, we believe in what you're doing, we're not going to micromanage. Um, that's a little bit off of what you're asking, but it's just a, a, it's all about building trust and relationships so you can hear the bad news when there's bad news. Uh, nobody's trying to live up to some benchmark that you've set that was unrealistic because you hadn't thought of this. Um, it's, it's all social. <laughs> Peter, did you want to follow up? I, I guess, you know, impact investing or mission-related investing, you know, it's one of those kind of jargony terms is, you know, we sit up here and we talk about it. Maybe there's a sense of what is it out there. I mean, mission, I mean impact investing really represents a, a spectrum of investing where the investor, be it an individual or a foundation uh, or even a corporation, really is investing with at least two purposes in mind. What is going to be the community benefit uh, as a result of that investment, and because of that community investment, how does that factor into your investment thesis? And, and, and those conditions actually vary in terms of how much of a trade-off an investor is willing to make to get to the community benefit uh, he, she, or they would like to see. And for, you know, in my view, in a community foundation perspective or a philanthropy perspective, when a foundation or a donor makes an investment, it should be a tool for philanthropy, that you're primary driver for that is the community benefit. Uh, but you are putting money out in a way that hopefully can achieve the outcome that you want, either because you can make a larger investment, so to speak, you can only make X amount of dollars available as a grant, but you could make a larger investment because even if you don't make any return, there's the ability to perhaps recover the capital to put it to use later for another community benefit so there you can recycle it. Uh, and so that often prompts foundations and individuals to make larger bets on things that are important where that type of capital is what's needed. And so I think it's one of those terms that represents such a broad spectrum because there are impact investors out there uh, that are doing good work that are really looking for more market rate returns, but they're looking to get those market rate returns in ways that are beneficial to the community or the environment. And that is um, important to have that capital motivated by those values, um, but it's different than having that investment be used as a tool for philanthropy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll just throw in that, again, philanthropy means the love of people, right? It has nothing to do with money, actually. and. The, the challenge is that when you have most, maybe everybody who has a lot of money has done it in the frame that we're in. I mean, I think by virtue of the fact they have, that's, that's the only way they could have made it uh, and for the most part. And so you've got people uh, with keen business sense and, and minds that have done really well and made a lot of money. Very hard to then say, okay, I wanna move that money over here and give it away outside of the framework that made it. And so therein lies the, the real friction is that you're trying to uh, hopefully um, encourage someone that, that has, uh, thinks they're brilliant because they made all this money and they might be, that maybe they're not the best person to make these judgments over here about what, what these investments should be. So that's just a, mm -hmm. a challenge in the mindset. And I wanna thank Peter Buffett and Peter Taylor for sharing 
their wisdom with us. So thank you. Thank you, David. <laughs>